Hello everyone, welcome back to the Mike Armstrong podcast show and uh, this morning I'm joined by Amy Sinner who is a voiceover um, artist, uh, fairly new in that sort of business and we're going to have a little chat about uh, business and marketing and networking and all those sort of things. And how are you doing this morning Amy, you okay? I'm great, thank you for having me. Yes, this morning it's uh, raining and really cloudy outside so... Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a bit of sunshine coming through my window, so you might get oh, that. Oh, you're so lucky! Oh my gosh! Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot better than it was yesterday at this time when it was absolutely battering it down. But uh, I think it's going to be sort of hit and miss all day today. I think, but uh, it should be getting nice towards the weekend. I've been uh, told, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you, uh, I will take you on that now. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, we normally have a wet bank holiday weekend, but hopefully it looks like it might be a dry one. But um, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself then. Obviously, you started out uh, recently in business as a sort of self-employed vo vo uh, voiceover artist. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and what else you do. Yeah, well, I um, really started it last November. Um, I decided I wanted to go into being a voiceover artist. So I bought all the equipment. Um, I made a show reel, and yeah, I've just been putting myself out there. And then I joined an agency. Um, and so far I've done international voicemail uh, for two American companies. The Americans love British accents. So I would love to capitalize on that. Um, and I've also done um, a pilot for a new animation for, I say, um, an eight-year-old little head ginger girl, which was very cool. So that's quite exciting. Um, and I've done radio. I've done radio, some radio adverts. So yeah, no, it's all progressing well, considering that I've just started. Yeah, no, I did. Um, I used to be. Well, I used to be. I am a, a musician, um, singer, songwriter. So I've done that for basically all of my life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how I really got into all of the voice kind of thing. Yeah, how do you get into that, by the way? That might be something I'd be interested in because obviously I'm a massive podcaster and I've been using my voice for a living for 30 years. Right. And uh, if I can get paid by, you know, saying some <laughs> stuff in other capacities than the ways I'm currently getting paid, then I might be interested in that. So uh, perhaps you can send me some um, some information or somewhere I've got to register or how, how does it get going? Well, as I said, I just bought all the equipment and I, I made a show reel of my voice doing different kinds of things like um, different styles. So I can do a general English accent or I can do very, very posh English accent or I can actually go into a Welsh accent if uh, <laughs> the Welsh people. Um, yes. And that's how I got started. And then I just, uh, I sent them out to uh, places that I thought would like, would need voiceover, so like um, entertainment agencies, um, filming production agencies, um, but the problem, a lot of those people actually have been voiceover artists in the past. So there was a thing in Wales, I sent it and they go, it was a film production agency and she was very friendly, but she's like, you know what, I've done voiceovers for 20 years, like on ITV. So I do my own. So I'm in no need of it. I was like, oh, okay. But so you just got to keep plugging. I mean, it is a very, very saturated market. Yeah. Um, so I've done probably a thousand auditions and I've had five or six jobs, but you have to keep plugging away and... You just never know. I mean, somebody's always looking for different types of voices. Yeah. Just fingers crossed that they, you know, you know, they want to choose you. <laughs> I registered once on the uh, extras. There's an extras website. I think it's based yeah. in South Wales somewhere where you get extra work and that. But um, I haven't had any yet uh, on that. But um, but the voiceover isn't there um, like a national database or registration or anything like that or an association you sign up with and, and get uh, work that way. Um, no, I mean, you can sign up. There is a, a voiceover agency as in network, but yes. that's network. I'm not sure if you get work through that. I think it's to register yourself. Um, but there are so many different agencies, um, especially around London, um, and through the UK. But I mean, just as you start, they do require you to have at least one year's paid experience. So it yes. is, it's a little bit difficult. Um, but it's just like acting, I guess. So you have to keep keep doing it and keep uh, plugging away. I think yeah, the easiest yeah. thing to start up people is to join these agencies where you pay a yearly membership, um, yeah. which I did. And I think but it's good for practice. Um, and I've learned a lot since I first wanted to do it in November to now. You know, I've learned so much doing yeah. that. So yeah, it's just stuff. 
But it's, uh, it's about timing sometimes, isn't it? Getting a lucky break, being in the right place at the right time, whatever, whatever like, you know. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Have you, have you thought about uh, setting up and running your own podcast? Um, well, I used to do, um, I used to do interviews. So, um, obviously, being a singer, I've come into contact with a lot of... Uh, I, I was a jazz musician to start with, so I, I know a lot of jazz musicians. So, when they used to come to Swansea, um, I used to interview them, and I set up my own YouTube channel. Uh, first of all, I did audio, and then I took my video camera around, and I, I did it that way. So, I kind of do have a, um, an interview YouTube channel. Yeah, um, okay. So I guess that's kind of like podcasting. I don't know. I don't know. It's just the words, the different kind of words, aren't they? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's similar to podcasting. The, the, the difference, the major difference is, so I actually um, obviously do my um, chats on Zoom so I can stick the audio in my podcast and the video on my YouTube channel. All right. but the, the, the benefit of podcasting is um, there's a lot of podcast um shops if you like where people can go online and download podcasts so if you like the difference is um whereas on youtube people are going to go onto youtube to look for the video for podcasts they go onto podcast stores like apple and itunes and google and uh, and they look for for podcasts so it's it's another it's two different places that you're marketing your content you know and to two different audiences you know youtube listeners are very different to podcast listeners you know, podcast listeners, I would say, are a bit more like, um, like uh, you know, like like Netflix streamers or whatever. You know, they want to get their um, TV content when they want to. Well, podcast listeners are people who like listen to radio or, or you know, thing, but they they want to listen to their own subject matter, their own brands, their own programs, their own niches, if you like. You know, so I think I think podcast is going to do to radio what. Netflix and, and other streaming sites have done to TV and that's just opened it up with a lot more programming and a lot more niche content for people to be able to sort of find so I think I think for, for you definitely you know as an artist but also as a voiceover artist as well be a great place for you to demonstrate all of your skills and your abilities and, and stuff you know. Do you find it's grown um, more on the visual side since zoom became popular because i only knew about zoom since lockdown happened yeah um, you know, people wanting to you know obviously get on meetings and with their friends and everything um so do, do you think that the visual side of this has has happened since lockdown kind of increased yeah i think uh, i think uh, i think podcasting was growing massively anyway and podcasting was a bit of a niche thing a bit like blogging yeah so i've been a blogger for 15 years so so i'm a communicator you know i'm in, I'm in sales and marketing so you know i use all channels to communicate and obviously i was blogging for a long time didn't realize how easy it would be to set up a podcast otherwise i'd have done one years ago but i set one up during lockdown but obviously podcasting is the next big thing and they've been talking about blogging being the next big thing for the 15 years i've been doing it you know because it's not it's not hit that mass market yeah? yeah, the podcast hasn't hit that mass market yet, but it's starting to. You start yeah. to see a lot of celebrities and a lot of high-profile people having podcasts. So it's starting to hit that mass market, and it may actually, I think it will, overtake blogging, which has been around a long time, but yeah. it'll, it'll reach the masses more. But I think where podcast has really come into its own is since Zoom, because obviously a lot of people are doing what I'm doing. They're recording their podcast episodes as well and hitting yeah. two birds with one stone, two platforms, two different audiences two different marketplaces one which is you know well the two most searched platforms in the world are google and youtube which google owns yeah so that's people looking for content and they're looking for often educational content and entertainment content and then you've got the podcast up and coming you know which people are looking for audio content because a lot of people are exercising so they like audio while they're exercising a lot of, you know the, the travel has dropped now but the, the people who still travel like audio in their car but they don't necessarily like radio they like educational audio yeah or niche entertainment without the adverts so so all in all you know i think yeah the the podcasting has been helped by the zoom and and the visual side of things and you know ultimately there are like, like i like to listen to audio a lot more than i do video okay. because i listen when i'm riding my bike or i'm you know when i'm doing other things and i'm a multitasker i like to listen and learn whilst doing other stuff yeah, yeah. And, and so you can't necessarily watch video doing that other stuff because you're concentrating on other stuff but you can listen 
you know, I mean, I'm big into learning and, and education and stuff. So, so I think, you know, as people, there's a massive sector, like in the personal development space and business coaching space and all that sort of thing, which I think the podcasting uh, growth is going to keep, keep going to. And, and, and also, you know, I, I like to speak out to entrepreneurs and salespeople and stuff. And those people are still traveling, you know, and they will return back to traveling face to face meetings and that. So, you know, getting them in the car. But um, yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, uh, it's a good use of, uh, of time to do both audio and video at the same time and reach different audiences, you know, if, and if your message is strong and, and, and you know, it's, it's visual as well as audio. Uh, you know, I, I try and use nice, interesting backgrounds and stuff to... to, to yeah, and I, I like the flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a personality anyway, a bit of a character. So, you know, people will either like you or they won't like, you know. And that, that's the way it is. But with yourself as well, you know, you're an artist, so you can you can talk about um, your art and you can interview other people, you know, in the jazz sector, musicians and all of that. Yeah. You know, so you, you, I think it's all about finding a niche because people want niche content. And I think, you know, you can combine the fact that you've got the, the artist side and the jazz and all of that with the other creative side of you and, and your voiceover work and that sort of thing and come up with, I'm sure you can come up with a format and a, a, a type of feature features and stuff which, which would be interesting and unique and, and would yeah. grab an audience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll definitely think about that. And, and you know, I thought about that way yeah 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 the other great thing about podcasts uh, and, and youtube actually both both is that once you put um once you record your episode and publish it on on podcasts on anchor which is the one i use and on youtube anchor automatically sends it to the stores where people can download the the, the app so so they automatically market the podcast for you which is great and you and both Anchor and YouTube though have share buttons as well, which means you can actually just tap the share button and share it into Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or those sort of places. Yeah. So actually, to me, having a podcast has meant my marketing. I used to use my blog as my content creator, and yeah. I used to market from the blog to all my social media. But now I'm marketing from the podcast and the YouTube channel to my blog and all the social media. So it actually gives you, it gives you. Uh, the ability to reach more markets quicker and to feed all your social media of your existing markets with good fresh content all of the time very easy oh my god one click of a button no more like on uh, social so, media trying to share everything yeah exactly it's a lot it's a lot easier if you can just click a button and, and share the content than having to keep creating content all the time on all of these platforms and and so the key thing like you're new in business the key thing in, when you're in business, a lot of people who are creative, especially, they don't particularly like doing sales and marketing because they <laughs> want to be creative. You know, that's yeah. the, they got into business to create, not to sell and market. Yeah. But you want to be able to create for audiences, which means you've got to sell and market it. Yeah. yeah. And, and often people don't have a, a t time to do as much marketing as they'd like to or they need to a lot of the time to make an effect. But, you know, doing these sort of things podcasting, YouTubing, um, letting the podcast share it to all of those places and then actually, you know, resharing it to your own existing audiences and communities and building those audiences and communities up, mm. but doing it as efficiently as possible and with as less time as possible, they're the key things to making long-term success in, in a business, really, is cracking, cracking the sales and marketing sort of activity. Yeah. So, uh, so I think, you know, your show reel would be perfect. You can stick that on a podcast as your introduction. And then, and actually, um, every time you record a new episode, you could put that as the introduction so that everyone who's listening to your podcast is actually listening to your show reel. Show reel. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Oh, I used to do that, and um, I put video together, and I put my because I write songs. Well, I used to write songs as well, and I put um, underneath the videos, I'd put one of my songs. Um, as the audio track yeah. uh, to the to the videos, but no, that's a that's a really good idea. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. I like helping people, uh, you know, grow their businesses. And you know, whereas you're creative at voiceovers and coming up with your voices and singing and the sound and probably writing a few songs and all that sort of stuff, my creativity is how to use sales and marketing tools and systems. Oh no, that's that. You know what? I've been trying all my life to get into the business side, and I've always like put it aside going no no I don't want to but 
you know, I really want to do that now because you see all these artists and they're using other people to manage um, yes. all of their money and all of what they do. And, and, and they've, they've said it themselves, they've lost all this money because they weren't taking personal control of the way that it was run. And um, other people were spending their money in the most ridiculous of senses or embezzlement, you know? So I yes. always have these things in the back of my mind. So I've always wanted to know how to do everything myself. Yeah. Um, to as much as my ability so that is kind of my goal right now is to learn how to do most things myself as much as I yeah, can when I was in a corporate world I got promoted nine times in six years and because I was always on a mission to become the MD and yeah. so I always took an interest in every aspect of the business if you like and I think you know when you are the business you should take uh, interest in every aspect doesn't mean you should do every aspect because no, grow, but you should know you about should, it and you should, yeah, yeah you, you should know about it you've got to be able to manage it so you should be able to take people on who specialize in certain areas but you yeah. should be able to know enough about what they do to manage them effectively because otherwise you're paying them for a lot of money and you don't know what they're doing exactly you know? And a lot of businesses do that with things like social media. You know, a lot of older business people will take on someone to do their social media, pay them a salary, and then just leave them to it. Yeah. So they're yeah. not actually looking over them to be the project manager. I think the one good thing about watching and The Apprentice, um, I do watch that, and I've taken on a lot, you know, um, taken on board a lot of what they said. And to be a project manager, you have to know everything and then yeah you delegate but then you have to know what they're doing in the first place otherwise how are you supposed to know yeah. they're doing it right or what you want so um i think that definitely i mean well, it's the I'm same just, with yeah. music. it's the yeah. same with music like making the album so obviously yeah. i sing and i write but i don't play i play the piano but obviously i don't play different instruments so then obviously i have but i have to know what they're doing what they have to play for me to know that they're doing it right rather than just leaving them to it yeah. um so that's so that, that's how making my own album i think has taught me so much on how to delegate but how to keep on top um because it's just so easy for singers to go all right you do this you do that and just leave them yeah. to it but it doesn't you don't then get the sound that you want so you have to have in your head you know the end product yeah, you've got to be the director and the creator you know, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly it's 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 like, like entrepreneurship's about uh, responsibility at the end of the day there's only one person responsible for your life and your company and your business and that's you so unless you're taking control of, of all the situations and overseeing it yeah then if somebody does something you know that you didn't want them to do you know, and then a lot of people will be like, well, I'll blame them because they did something that I didn't want them to do. But it's actually, they lost the control. So it's their fault, you know, yeah. because they didn't instruct them properly or they didn't communicate, didn't manage them, they didn't measure them properly, whatever. You know, and this yeah. happens all the time in business and people like to blame other people. But, you know, ultimately, yeah. when you take control of your own life and your own business, the fuck always stops with you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's something which is, you know, you have to... To me, I like to learn a lot about a lot of things so that even if I, I like to do a lot of things as well because I'm that way inclined. But even if I've always wanted to be an MD of a business, I got to one under the MD in a corporate world. And then I decided actually I always, what I always really wanted was to be an MD of my own business. And ultimately when you're the MD of a business, I'm, I'm somebody who believes if you're running a business, you should know everyone in that business and you should know what everyone in that business does and you should know you know what everyone in that business is targeted to do and how they're doing compared to that target if you like yeah, yeah. yeah. and so like i watch their uh, programs like the secret millionaire and things like that where they go yeah. undercover in their own business yeah. i'm like you know you're not really a boss if you can go undercover in your business and people don't recognize you and they don't know who you are then you're not really a leader you're not really a boss because they don't even know who you are so how can you lead them yeah. No, that's so true. People think that oh, I'm going to become the boss and then I'm just going to tell other people what to do and I'm just going to sit here reaping the rewards. And uh, I think it's quite uh, amusing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so I always think of, you know, somebody who's a pure leader who's inspiring their troops is somebody like Richard Branson, for example. example. Yeah. And I bet Richard Branson could never go undercover in any of his businesses. They'd all spot him a mile away. Oh, well, yeah, well, he's too high profile, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, exactly, but that's but in your own business, you should be too high profile. If people don't yeah, know your profile, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. If they don't know your business <laughs> and what you stand for, how can they deliver it? 
very true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, um, how you got into uh, uh, jazz and then uh, how you got into the voiceover side of things and, and maybe a little bit about what your, your plans are. Okay, well, um, you know, I, I, I've been singing all of my life. So I started in my first talent competition when I was six years old. Um, and I never really thought about jazz back then. It was just things I used to watch on TV um, that just happened to turn out to be jazz songs. But I did, um, I did my grade eight. So I, did, I was classically trained. Um, I went to Kassainen College. Um, at the time that Catherine Jenkins was there, actually, for throw okay. that in. So I was in the same... Uh, same class as her um, and she was lovely I have to say but she was more on the classical side and I was more on the jazzy side I guess and then I went to Leeds College of Music um, I did my degree and then I came back and um, I didn't do that much jazz to be honest with you I, I did um, as in like I guess jazz to most people it, it, it depends if you know jazz a lot if you're into it I guess as songs go we call it big band and swing like Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and obviously that's the type um, that I used to do and then I got to do all the pop stuff as well uh, so I did weddings and jazz clubs and then I started to write my own songs uh, when I was 31 and then kind of that raised the bar um, because then people started to take more interest um, like they do in singer songwriters uh, so the jazz side came into play that my mind is kind of all complicated and doing my to my album um, kind of got it out there and it wasn't for everyone because what goes out in my head um, is not really uh, for everyone I guess so but I learned I learned a lot from that but then following that um, I did like different types of singles so then I ended up doing country rock um, so I was really into country rock and that was my last single that I put out but during that time as I said I um, I was into interviewing. I, I wasn't good at speaking. And to be a singer, obviously, you have to be a front person and you have to speak, you have to be funny. And that's where my, um, I think my talents were a little bit underrated, I think. And I needed to become more fluent at the speaking. So I decided to just be more confident and interview people. So I'd just go to random musicians and start interviewing them. And they did um, a jazz festival every year. They used to in Mumbles. Um, so that's where I started doing on the audio and then I'd put it out there. And then when musicians, like I did Buddy Greco when he came, I don't know if you know Buddy Greco, but he was one of the members of the Rat Pack, like the honorary member. Um, and he came to the Taliesin Art Center. So that was one of my first, I was very lucky. I got to interview him and I got to interview um, Kyle Eastwood, who is uh, Clint Eastwood's son. Um, so that's kind of my claim to fame. Um, he was um, absolutely amazing. And, you know, we talked about his dad. And <laughs> it was really cool. I put that on YouTube as well. Um, so, yeah, no, that was really cool. So I did. So I think that started me off speaking and obviously doing my own songs. I was on radio, BBC Radio Wales and Radio Luxembourg. So I've been interviewed. And people always used to say I had a nice voice, but I never really took it seriously. And they used to ask me to do voiceovers. But again, I never, I was like, it's just part of the singing and being a, a musician to, you know, do these kind of things. Um, I kind of started to get a little bit um, down on the whole singing thing, maybe a year or so ago, because um, I, I think like it wasn't, it, it was a little bit depressing because you'd go out there and people weren't like venues, they didn't want to pay you. So I'd say a fee and then they'd go, oh, well, you know what, we could get about three or four people for that. And I was just like, all right, okay. And they just wanted people, for, they just wanted anybody, any just background music or even if it was party music, but they didn't want to pay for it. Oh. Um, so I, I was starting to feel a little bit down. Is this that, around so. uh, the, the, the bars and clubs of Swansea or? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just everywhere. And you know, they wanted you to yeah. tour and they didn't want to give you money for that. that and, and I've been doing it for so long. And you know, I was like, well, actually I'm worth, I'm worth it. I'm worth this kind of money. You know, I'm a professional. I haven't just started out, but it wasn't really, you know, getting me anywhere. So I was just like, I love singing, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I, I will always love singing. And I did Facebook, Facebook Live, sorry. Um, and I did that over lockdown. Have you ever done an album? Sorry? Have you done an album? Yeah, I put an, yeah that's what I started with. I did um, a whole album called A Sin With Love. And I put it out there. I did it myself. So it's on Spotify and, you know, it's on everywhere. All the downloads, iTunes and things yeah. like that. And as well as my singles 
that I followed up. So I did it all. I did the marketing. And yeah. Did you have any successes? Did you have any, any go you know, viral or anything? Um, well, I did actually. I did a video as well um, for my last one called Need You Here, which was a duet um, yeah. with a musician called John Sudbury. And the video did. And I don't know how it went overnight. It was amazing. I got like, I, I've never had it before. Like I think about over three, 4,000 hits on it, it's just like over a 24 hour period. I was just like, wow, that's like 500 likes. I did, this is on the YouTube channel. And I think somebody from Twitter saw it. I think there was some sort of celebrity in, in Spain or yeah. <laughs> and they tweeted it. And then, you know, that's how it went. I was going to say that, that sounds to me like an influencer got hold of it and, and shared it or something like, you know, for you I think that's that, what you? happened. I do think, cause I was like, oh my God, that was like really, wow. So no, and I did, I think it was um world world hits or something and i think i got to number four on the, on their charts that was for um in my mind which uh, was for like a world yeah. music uh, single that i did but then that's what i was doing so then i was looking for things to do and you know what the voice somebody mentioned it to me i was a friend with a lot of actors and things and they were like oh why do you know do the voiceovers you, you know you have a nice voice expressive so i'm like all oh, right okay so um, but Again, you never take these things seriously, but like in November, I was like, no, you know what, let's go for it. I really love to talk <laughs> and I love to use my voice and it's something that I know, know of and I think I can train in this. So that's why I went into voiceovers. And you know what, I really love it. I really love to do it. I love to do different, I, t I do take direction well. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm going to say that. So if somebody says something, and no, I you've been do trained, well. don't you? You've been trained professionally as a singer and all the rest of that. So you're used to being coached. I am used to being coached, but yeah, and, and and you can the tone, you know, you know, different tones and different exciting. But I'm gonna say at the beginning I didn't. So and I was listening to myself back and I'm like, oh my god, that sounds really depressing. I was saying it, no wonder they didn't choose me. I was like, so you kind of learn and learn from it. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy, but if you're like focused and you stick at it and you know, you keep practicing, anybody can do this. It's just yeah, have you, have you thought about doing um, uh, The Voice or The X, uh, X Factor? I'm not, I'm, I'm not for that. I don't know. I'm not for overnight fame and I'm a prize. And I think this was the one thing that maybe um, hindered my singing career. I'm a private person and I want my family and friends to stay private. I don't want my life on a TV screen for five minutes, everybody's world to turn upside down and then it ends. And you see all these, I mean, you, you see what it does to people. Um, like, look at Susan Boyle. She went into rehab or depression. Yeah. Because her face. So I, think, I think that depends on your own maturity, your own self-confidence and self-worth. Just I think my family, though. I don't want my family and friends yeah. to be in the spotlight. I don't think it's fair. And no. I think that's one of the things that I've never really wanted. And they dig. The media dig and they go into your background. And I don't like that. I don't know. No, that, that, that is a big hindrance. That's a big uh, psych, psych, psychol psychological hindrance into, into, you know, it's quite hard to get growth anyway. But if you've got blockers, if you like, uh, you know, stopping you, then that could be a big... That, could that be was a big quite big. And I had to analyse that and look back at, you know, all these things that I wanted to do. But on the background, yeah, yeah as you say, your psychology is saying, no, you don't want to be because you don't want the thing that comes with it. So yeah. with voiceover, you can be as famous as you like and nobody's gonna recognize you because yeah. really it's about your face, it's about your voice. So yeah. if you recognize your voice, that's fine. But you know, not necessarily recognize your face. So. Now it sounds to me like you should be a career backing singer. Have you tried that? Um, I have tried backing singing, but they haven't really chosen me because my voice is a bit unique. Is um, it? I used to go for it, yeah, I did. But what about don't, don't jazz, jazz um, singers have backing singers? They do, but again, my voice stands out. Like throughout my whole life, um, I, even at college, they didn't choose me for certain things because when, when I'm quite small, so I'm, I stand out anyway, and my, and, and my voice is quite big. So that's an extra, so it takes away from them. So I did actually join um, a jazz one on Elvis, backing vocalist, and he kind of fired me <laughs> because it was like, well, I need to be center of attention. Yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. You, were, you were too loud. You were over, over, overshadowing his song. Um, well, I wasn't his, loud, but yeah, I was overshadowing because, again, I, have, I guess I, I have a different technique to my voice, and it doesn't seem... Yeah. Everyone. My, my guess is, though, if you can sing and you've been trained to become very vocal, you could, could you retrain to sort of tone that down a bit? I can't. It's my personality. <laughs> it's like, that comes out. I can't be down. It's like, you know, you can't, like, no. my fingers. Like, I've done nails, no. like, you know, I was talking about different yeah, colours. Yeah, your personality, personality is just sort of right. out there, like... 
it's out there and, and, and I think I would be doing myself a dis, uh, you know, a, a, yeah. a disservice if I was supposed to hold yeah, that. It's a shame that because you've got the talent and, and, and it's like two conflicting things really because you, 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 you've got the star quality if you like and that passion and enthusiasm and uniqueness but you don't want the knock on effect of the star quality so therefore and, and you're too loud but if you like or too sort of different and unique to be just a backing singer but that would be ideal for your life because it doesn't come with any baggage like you know it's like um i was watching a comedy routine the other night and, and, and i've heard it before I can't remember who was doing it i think it might have been um uh, Nish Kumar, Nish Kumar, I think he was talking yeah. about um, the drummer from um, the drummer from um, what's this, the band that sings Yellow? He was all Coldplay. Just not, uh, Coldplay. Yeah, basically the drummer from Coldplay. Uh, the, the band has got four people and they all earn the same amount of money. And he was going like um, like the thing is with the drummer from Coldplay is he. He earns the same as Chris Martin, for example. Nobody knows who he is, yeah? And he gets to sit down all day long whilst doing his job, yeah? And apparently he was in Game of Thrones. And he, was in, the, he was in the Red Sea, uh, the Red uh, Scene, which was the wedding where there was the blood... Very... <gasps> that's brilliant. Oh, my God. Oh, is that? Oh, he that. was in the band playing the drums, right? But, but still, nobody knows who he is, right? <laughs> he's basically saying, like, he's been earning multi million pounds and nobody yeah. actually gets to know who he is. I wouldn't yeah. know who he was now, like, you know? I only know Chris Martin from Goldberg. And he was saying, yeah. actually, there's two other people in Goldberg as well. Nobody knows who they are, like, you know? That's so, perfect. I, yeah, I wish, actually, sometimes I could be a drummer because you get to hide. You don't need to take the forefront. Um, yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's sort of like, you know, that's what you need to take up drumming. Well, actually, you said you play piano, you know, maybe you can be the p piano player for somebody. You know? <laughs> no, yeah. no, you know what, it's just, it's just the way it is and the way that life is so taken. And you yeah, learn a lot. I mean, nothing's, uh, I mean, just because I didn't reach stardom singing, I mean, it's, it's taught me so much. And it's taught me who, the type of person I want to be and the type of experiences that I want. Yeah. Um, and but your, yeah. your family, though, I would say your family probably would want you to do what, what, whatever. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surmising, but usually families do want you to, to do whatever you want to do, and they'll take whatever slack. You know, there's lots of people. It depends the way you handle it. I think you can, you can make it, and you can, you can become famous, but you can not court it, and you can be quite private with it. There are people who, who do manage to pull that off. It's, it's rare. It all depends how much that intrusion comes. But there are people who do put it off, you know. Um, just uh, just depends the way you manage things. I think that all down to the, your personal, you know, way of doing things. Uh, I think there are there are people I know who are really really famous and they just disappear. And you're like, well, where have they? I've heard of them for like five years or something. You know, it's not you know, it's not just their fame. It's also the lifestyle that comes with it. I like stability. Um, so I'm not one for touring. I don't want to be away from my family and friends yeah. on end. I don't want to live in hotel rooms. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, a certain lifestyle comes with being a touring musician and to earn money these days, you have to do live tours. I mean, when yeah, no, that's tours. the only way to make money, isn't it? That really? is the yeah. only way because you have to do promotion. I mean, you can put as many singles out there, but as, unless you're regularly touring and interacting with the fans on a, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis, yeah. it becomes difficult. And touring is, you know, it's just, it's just hard. Yeah, um, and on a social media basis, you've got to be active on that as well. And I guess, you do, you know, you don't necessarily, um, if you want to... I don't like Twitter, price. again, yeah, I've taken myself yeah. off Twitter. I don't like Twitter at all. Yeah. I don't like the way people can interact and be, um, be mean. Yeah, it's quite, a negative, it's, quite, it's quite a negative platform, Twitter. But I, yeah. I, I myself am looking to become a global speaker. So not, not because yeah. I want to be famous, but because I want to yeah. help as many people as I can and impact as many people on the planet. And to be honest with you, I'm very sort of self-assured in that. And I, I, I'm looking forward to the day that I get some abuse on Twitter. I think that's <laughs> different. I think that being, no, no, I think being a speaker is a different thing than being a singer. Being, yeah, being yeah, a singer, maybe, everybody yeah. thinks that they have an opinion. You know, yeah. because they think that they can do better or they have their way and they're, they're very vocal about it. But being a speaker, I think you've got, 
more of a more of a Charles. I don't see why you should get any uh, any nasty comments, but if you want them, okay. no, but, but, no, I, I would I, I would enjoy the challenge. I would like you know what I mean. But a lot of people don't like Twitter because of all the negativity you know? But I, yeah, to yeah, be honest, yeah. I couldn't give a monkey's what they said. It wouldn't bother me yeah. at all. Like, you know what I mean? So so I would. You can handle it though. Do you think you could have like a Twitter war? I just have a bit of a banter with them because like <laughs> I, I know I know I know that I wouldn't get bothered by it, but I know other people would. So therefore, I would yeah. like. I'd be like, well, if you're going to say something, then be prepared to take it yeah absolutely but, you know, yeah. Yeah. but I always think that if you're going to be that kind of a star on Twitter don't handle your own tweets I yeah. think always give it to somebody else yeah, because that's, that's good, people you know. are just sensitive I think I would take it personally yeah. if people said it even if I didn't know them um, I do a bit like, like I think is it um, James Blunt is it James Blunt he, he, he handles his uh, tw tweets really well because he's a right. squaddy he's a squaddy you know what I mean <laughs> He's, yeah. he's not bothered by the people, you know, and that's the thing. The, the thing is, I, what I understand is that with those sad keyboard warriors, the nameless, <laughs> yeah. faceless people, yeah. is that they're sad people. You know that's what I mean? It. So the last thing I would do is allow them to affect me, and I don't understand why other people do, but I suppose other people are maybe a little bit more sensitive than, than, than I am. I'm quite a hard, thick, thick skin. I've been in sales for 30 years. <laughs> oh, it's, sorry, it's been my job to take rejection constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, I suppose I'm probably built for, for, for that type of abuse, like, you know. Well, I think if you've grown up, and I think if you're taught, especially with young singers today, if you're going to go out there, then you're going to have to have, I think, skin. I mean, in my day, I say, I'm not that old, but in my day, we didn't have social media when I was growing up. Um, and I think you're not trained to handle that, the abuse. Yeah you'd get so i think if you're trained that's fine because you you, you know you can develop it but that, that's the that's the only because yeah this is it's just a psychology thing isn't it people it just allow other people to affect their psychology but i always yeah. say you know to me i train myself on not really giving a monkeys what other people yeah. think i got that's to great. the age yeah thing. i got to the age of, I, I would say probably late 30s you know of, of being like what most people reach at 60 where they just don't really give a monkeys what other people think you know what yeah. i mean and I think it's a good stage to get at in life, you know, so I got there really early, but I've always been quite advanced in certain things. And I suppose, you know, once you realise that you can build a successful career in sales, for example, making yeah. good money, but with a load of people still telling you to piss off and they don't yeah. like you and they're not interested in your product, yeah. what you realise is it doesn't really matter about those people. All it matters about is that percentage of people, you know, that, that do engage with you and do want to yeah. know more and... and, and buy from you or whatever like you know and, and that's where I've always I've understood that sales marketing business whatever so it's a percentage game you know all those people that don't care or hate you or whatever or don't like it or don't agree with it they're a big percentage but as long as there's enough percentage of people who do care and do like right. it whatever then you know you've got a business you know? maybe everybody should start off in sales then to yeah, develop well, that thick skin. <laughs> I, I, I would highly recommend it. I think I started out in door-to-door -door sales, selling double glazing. Oh, so, you know, that wasn't <laughs> yeah. as hard as it gets. And actually, you know, every job I've ever done since then has been, you know, easy in my head. Yeah. It's been easier because once you start off hard, then other things are easier. You know, things yeah. do get easier, you know? So I'm, yeah. I'm a big believer in you should always start off doing something hard, difficult, you know, something that's going to toughen you up a bit. You know, yeah. I'm a massive believer, like, for example, if you study it and you watch it, people who are older, who leave their businesses to someone who's younger, who yeah. was brought up with the trappings of that business and the wealth and whatever, their business always goes down the pan quickly because the yeah. person taking over the business hasn't actually gone through the struggles, the strains, the stresses to be able to run a business in that position. So as soon as the, a bad thing happens, they don't know how to deal with it, yeah? Whereas when you actually start off at the bottom in the hard grounds and the hard graft, you have to yeah. get yourself out of that tough situation. And as things get easier and get, get easier though, when that tough situation comes back at you, because life gives you tough situations all the time, you're prepared and me mental, you, you've got the mental capacity and the experience to be able to get through those challenges. And to adapt. Um, so, so to me, like, like if if um, and when I, I build a successful company and I got young children, I would never give them the reins at the top like some big business people do. I would always put them in at the bottom and get mm -hmm. them to go through the heartache and the hardness of having to work their way up. And only if they deserve the spot at the top would I give it to them. Yeah. I think that's why a lot of people fail, a lot of businesses actually, because they're so high up and they know that their father or mother is in the top 
top spot and they don't want to do the hard work they want to jump straight in it and as you said there's so many failings in that is that if you have like if you grow up having not so much of an easy life it kind of prepares you for the difficultness and you have the empathy and you can maybe relate to people more um that's why i, I really love the royal family saying that and i actually love william and, and harry i mean no matter what they've done you know because they've actually become more real living yeah. In, in this kind of a day and age and their mom dying and you know they've seen that and they've had to go through all of that and you have to give them full respect for you know yeah. for coming through and actually come across as real genuine you know real genuine people um so you have to go through some hardships even if it doesn't happen to you in early life it's going to happen to you at yeah. some point and it's the way you That's deal right. with it that you know makes you who you are so, most yeah. successful people have had the hardship. That's why they go on to do great things. That's why the worst, I believe, the worst thing you can do with kids is wrap them up in a bubble and make their life so perfect. Yeah, yeah. because once the actual, they hit reality and they hit you know, running a business or trying to get on in the profession or whatever, and they realize actually life isn't a bubble and it's not all soft and fluffy and, and actually it's tough and you've got to be tough, you know, to me you failed them as a parent because you haven't prepared them for the realities of the world and you've made them too soft like you know that's my my, my viewpoint on that so uh <laughs> well so. everyone tries to protect their child i think it's just an instinct but there's only so much you can protect them from and yeah that yeah. you know yeah, you've got, to, you've got to face them up with the realities of, of life, you know, because otherwise... Well, we'll you have to do that when they're so young, you know, to go no. from here at all. <laughs> you're no, only you five. have to do it when they're young, but, but you have to do it when, they're, they're, they're edu when, when their ability to be educated is there, you've got to yeah, use yeah. it. You've got to use it and educate them, because I think so many people, they wrap them up in bubbles, they forget that about actually... I'm going to let them out of the nest at some point and I need to give them the skills to be able to, you know, yeah. manage outside of the nest. Otherwise, they, uh, um, a big bird's going to come along and chew them up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. No, no, it's true. They have to be, they have to be a bit more worldly and knowledgeable um, of all, all different things. It's like seeing, wasn't it, it's like um, on that children's uh, TV channel, you had that uh, woman with one arm and yeah. all these parents were complaining, going, oh my God, this is going to, affect our children and I went to my nephew because he was there at the time and he, I, he goes I don't see anything different and no. I was like no you know what I know and and the problem is the more you um show or the more that they're you know I can't remember the word now but the more they see different types of people different yeah. colors different like abilities they're gonna see it as normal and they're not gonna like stare at different people if they've got something a deformity on their face they're gonna say oh this is just a normal person and I think that's the way adults need to be as well. They're just so fixated on... Well, that's it. The kids don't even notice. The, the parents say, oh, it's going to traumatise the kids. The kids are just normal. Yeah. You know, it's, they it's see just, it as normal. Yeah. Yeah. It's just traumatising to the parents because they weren't introduced to it as a kid. So it's like... So, that, so all the parents see it is the uh, abnormality, but the kids not even seeing that, like, you know? So, yeah, th those parents who... You know, they're the same parents who don't want sex education in school and all the rest of that. And I'm like, well... You know, where, where are you going to teach your kids then? What, you know, what do you want them to grow up and not understand how everything works, which is what happens? And then they turn to, you know, pornography or the playground or whatever to get all of their knowledge. And like, you know, well, is, isn't it better that you teach them the facts? <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it, yeah, no, I see your point. <laughs> is it better you teach them the facts rather than just let them just work it up for themselves? Like, you know, it, it, Scandinavia and places like that, they teach them young and, and it's just normal. It's just a normal part of life. But in the UK, sometimes we have these... People who, you know, they go off. Uh, they go off at like they, they were going off at um, what's his name, um, the chef. You know, who was trying to get everyone to heat healthy, and they were like putting pasties through the fence and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, I think the, 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 there's, there's some crazy people in the UK, and they object to everything. And, and like, um, you know, but it's just like drinking, isn't it? It's like in Europe, alcohol is normal, so they do it at the yeah. dinner, dinner table, say eight and nine. And here, you get so many binge drinkers, and they're in the park at the age of thirteen, you know, drinking cider. And we've got the, one of the most worst alcoholic um, statuses, maybe in Swansea, where everyone goes out on a Friday and Saturday night, and they cause yeah. so much trouble. And I think if you maybe make things more normal when they're young yeah. they're not going to see it as oh my god this is something that's taboo oh, i'm gonna to have to try it like smoking or whatever so it's, if the they grow that, up, yeah. it's the same as like most adult stars you yeah, know go into yeah. that industry yeah and they, they get brought up in a convent and by nuns and yeah. stuff a lot of them do like you know if you stop yeah. people from something they want it more and more and more whereas yeah. if you just 
just yes. introduce it into their life as a just it's just normal yeah because and it's not it's not a big deal so if you say look yeah. drinking it's not a big deal do it with dinner fine you're not gonna want to binge drink or think you know get some uh, get absolutely you know paralytic yeah. when you're out on a night out or you go to you know this is the problem when people grow up say to 18 and they go to university and they haven't done anything before they're 18 because their pet they don't want to you know their parents yeah. don't want them doing it they get out on their own and they're just like they they, they kind of go downhill so forget their studies they're yeah. kind of out every night drinking and doing whatever and i think this is this is a problem maybe that they're britain yeah i think i think it's because um it's it's because of the left and the right and whatever i'm much more i suppose in in, in that type of thing parenting etc i would say i'm left i'm right i'm middle i'm a bit of everything i'm the right i'm the right solution for the right pro for the wrong pro right problem if you like you know, <laughs> the right solution for the right situation if you like you know so, yeah. so sometimes so to me but but I, I always seem to the scandinavians always seem to get life quite right you know the balance of education and knowledge and yeah. lib liberalism and that sort of thing and and they're always in the top of all the the, the tables and stuff and that's because you know they're just chilled out and relax and just whatever you know just whatever will be will be just life is life and just just get on and do it and they're not all, all like oh this is bad and this is good and you know extremes really they just yeah. think, they just this is the point though people it's... just want to put bad and good they want to put boxes rather yeah, than sure. making their own opinions and their own morality whether they see it as right or wrong so you know yeah. one wrong to one person is not is right to another and you shouldn't yeah. judge them for it and i think we like to judge people or a society of, oh no 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 we're going to make judgments about their life yeah, you know, yeah. well I, I don't know see I, I it's very black and white that's that's it, it, it is. People, but people black like to black see black and white they don't yeah. want to see the gray they don't want to see the color um no. and i think this is our problem this is where we need yeah. to reform our attitudes in the way well, that yeah, we for, for me to, to be to be honest life's more interesting in the gray and the gray is the, really? the, the yeah. bespokeness you know it's yeah. the it's the what makes everyone unique and different and you know things are black and white they're always much more complex than that you know and there's always a rainbow of colors you know and, 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 and ultimately yeah i think two people are too simplistic and they're on one side or the other and then the other one's wrong when, when yeah. the reality is there's no right and wrong in most situations just opinion and yeah. uh, and, and people just need to chill out a little bit more i think <laughs> so, and, and, and learn, learn off the Scandinavians who are just like chilled out and just whatever will be will be and we'll we'll just deal with the situation whatever the color it is you know whether it's gray or whether it's pink or whether it's you know some other color that we've just created on the spot we'll deal with it of, of course and everything will work itself out eventually yeah <laughs> definitely 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 so uh so yeah so um the voiceover then uh, business is uh, is is up and running and i suppose from from what you said it'll take a year before that that maybe can get a bit of steam and momentum because of the yeah. industry expectations if you like you have is to build that, a reputation as well you yeah. see people have to get to know you and i, and I think i took <laughs> took it for granted maybe i didn't realize how hard it was going to be because i was singing from all of my life and i forgot how hard that actually is if you, you're just starting out. So because I've been doing it for so long, I took it for granted that people knew who I was. Um, yes. so, yeah, so it's the same with the voiceover. So at some point, sometimes when you've done so many auditions and you, you know, you're not getting anything and you I can't kind of feel down going, oh my God, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? And then I'm, I have to make myself remember all of the times that, you know, how long it took to get the singing going and, yeah. and the music and to have a reputation. So I think, um, yeah, no, I'm just going to stick with it. And I think it's worth and it. If it's anything you will worth be able it. To, yeah, you will be able to leverage some of your previous contacts as well, you know, from like radio stations and, and things yes, like that. Because yeah, some of those, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I would always say. You, they just have to see you in a new light because then I get, oh, she's a singer and I'm trying to, not well, I, I'm trying to a little bit move away from that um, because yeah. I don't really want to to do the singing thing much anymore. Yeah. So I want to go into voiceover and stuff. But um, yeah, but yeah, no, no, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stick with it and go with it. And yeah, do yeah. you use uh, LinkedIn? I do. Yes, I'm on your LinkedIn, Mike. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, we are on LinkedIn. Yeah, we just <laughs> connected uh, last week, didn't we? Um, yeah. I was going to say what I would do is go back around all your old contacts who you think could help you with the new business and yeah. just let them know, send them a little message just to say, oh, by the way, I'm doing this now. 
and if uh, there's there's ever a need in in your radio station or if you can pass me on if they're the person who does the presenting or bu or interviewing or booking or whatever and you're like yeah. okay if you can pass me on to whoever does the voiceover work or yeah. you know <clears throat> just <clears throat> excuse me uh, just leverage your existing contacts but in a new capacity like you know okay yeah Okay. But uh, yeah, brilliant. And and what's the plans for the future? Uh, are you just gonna be be a one man band voiceover artist, or would you want to take other artists on and help them? Or what, what's the plans? Well, if I could get to that experience, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to <laughs> be. Yeah. Um, I don't mind helping out. I mean, I, I have knowledge about the voice. You know, I mean, I've been doing it for so long. So if anybody yeah. needs any help with vocal coaching, I mean, I don't, I don't advertise it. I don't put it out there to be honest with you. But on um. If, if I feel like I want to do it, I will help people. If they have like a passion, I really feel like people need to, I want to feel like people have a passion to do it. I mean, a lot of people take it on because they think that their parents want them to do it or they think that, um, well, for different other reasons. Different but if they have a, a, a passion that they really want to do it, then I'll say, yeah. I will. I don't have to you do my that. And I've got a lot of knowledge about life. <laughs> I had a hard life growing up, so I'm not going to lie. So I have got a lot of knowledge about how to be resilient. Um, yeah. amongst diversity and how that impacts your life and how that can make you a better person. I mean, people think that they regret what they've gone through and they wish that their life was easier, but I, I think it's just to accept um, who they are and what they've gone through and be grateful for what they have and accept who they are right now and how that can help other people through their lives. And and I, I know that Colin, we had um, um, an interview, you know, Colin, I can't remember his name now. Oh my God, what's his name? Colin, Colin. Uh, McLaughlin. That's it, we're coming and I, think, um, I saw him speak and I think the one thing that I really loved about it, that he was so um, transparent about his early life and how difficult he had it and the type of person, you know, how it's made him become the person he is today. And, and I think that's a great trait to have um, and it's the acceptance. So yeah, it's learning from different people as well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, how do people get in touch with you if they uh, happen to stumble across this video and they're interested in a... Uh, um, energetic uh, voiceover artist from Swansea. How do they? How do yeah, they get it? Less energetic person as well. I can play a very, you know. Yeah, yeah, play a depressed role. <laughs> but, uh, I, I can play that person as well. I just uh, have a late night, have an early morning, and. Uh... <laughs> oh, oh my god! It's like you know when you're getting in, when you've had a night out or you're going in a taxi or somebody. And they really want to talk to you after you're like you're really hungover, and you're just like, oh my god, please stop talking to me. <laughs> I don't want to talk. But uh, yeah, uh, well, they can. My name is Amy Sinha, S I N H A. You can just Google it, or you can find me on um, Facebook under Amy Sinha, British voiceover artist, um, or on LinkedIn um, again, Amy Sinha, um, or on Instagram. At real Amy Sinha. Let's just use my name. <laughs> you can yeah, find yeah. me. So just, just Google your name and uh, search for Google it and she'll find you. Exactly. I even have a website, amysinha.com. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. All right, Deb. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming on the podcast and sharing uh, some information. Yeah, sharing uh, lots of energy and information about how other uh, people can maybe get on in doing a bit of voiceover art artist, etc. You can do it too, Mike. You should go for it. I, I can see it. I can, you know. Yeah, I might. Uh, I might give it a go. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, Close my day. eyes. Yeah, I can hear you speak. Go on, say something. Yeah, um, I've got a very unique sounding voice. It's quite a gruff, quite a manly uh, <laughs> voice. So you know, you do, I'm sure you do have it. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, you know, I can play, uh, you know, Celtic warrior or something like that. You know. <laughs> Video gaming is so big right now. Oh yeah, there's a lot of Celtic warriors in that as well. That's a good niche. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to see, uh, see see what I can do. I'll, uh, I'll have a look into it. I get a bit of time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming on the podcast and uh, have a great day. You too. Thank you so much. Yes, bye bye. Right, there's nothing else left for me to say other than have a great day. I know I will. And thanks very much for listening. Cheers. Bye bye.